A warm welcome to your Barbados Today evening Monday, January 24. A brand new ministerial team will be sworn in on Wednesday. After much anticipation, Prime Minister Mia Motley made the announcement this evening in a national address. Notable changes to the cabinet include the naming of a deputy prime minister and three senior ministers. Deputy Prime Minister of Barbados from Wednesday shall be Santia Bradshaw and she shall have coordinating responsibility as a senior person for infrastructure. She shall also be the Minister of Transport, Works and Water Resources and shall be leader of government business in the House of Assembly. The Honorable Dale Marshall, who has already been sworn in as Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, will assume the role as the Senior Minister Coordinating for Governance in our Cabinet. And I thank him for accepting that. Jerome Walcott will be the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, but he will be the Senior Minister Coordinating for all social and environmental policy as we go forward with this new arrangements. Kerry Simmons will be the senior minister coordinating the productive sectors but will substantively be the minister of energy and business development and may I say here that business development will include from small business to international business because as we made clear in the last term all global business is now local and all local business is now global. The Prime Minister said her government's new development agenda, entitled Our Barbados, Owning Our Future, is a transformative one that's intended to build human and social capital and a sustainable economy. Here are the other members of the 20-member ministerial lineup. Wilfred Abrams will be Minister of Home Affairs and Information. Indar Weir, Minister of Agriculture and Food and Nutritional Security, will be retained. The new Minister of Health and Wellness will be Ian Gooden Edgel. Lisa Cummins will be Minister of Tourism and International Transport, taking responsibility back now also, not just for the Grant Lee Adams Airport, but for the Bridgetown Port, which reverts to international transport. She will also be Leader of Government Business in the Senate. Kay McConney will be Minister of Education, Technological and Vocational Training. Dwight Sutherland will be the Minister of Housing, Lands and Maintenance. Kirk Humphrey, Minister of People, Empowerment and Elder Affairs. Adrian Ford will be Minister of Environment and National Beautification. And might I remind you that the blue and green economy will now be within Minister Ford's portfolio and environment, uh, with the exception of the Bridgetown Port, which goes back to international transport. Colin Jordan will retain Ministry of Labor, Social Security and Third Sector. Davidson Ishmael will be the new Minister of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology. Charles Griffith, Minister of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment. As before, Ryan Strawn will continue in my ministry and he will be the Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs. And there will be a new person appointed in the Office of the Prime Minister as Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister and that she will be Chantal Monroe Knight. In other news this Monday, for the second time in less than a week, fire wreaked havoc in the city, leaving 12 people homeless, including 8 adults and 4 children. The blaze, which was reported around 11.15 a.m., quickly spread, damaging 5 houses. Divisional Fire Officer Errol Gaskin told reporters at the scene that two officers were also injured. The worst that we have is that two of our officers were exposed to extreme heat, who are now in the care of the emergency um, medical services, one with blisters to the floor, the other one with extreme singeing. But other than that, the situation is now under control. A group of young men from the community quickly spun into action to assist the 18-man team from the Barbados Fire Service. Marlon Richards spoke on behalf of the group seen on top of rooftops soaking homes with water. The fire was very uncontrollable for sure. So, so we had to really take real action into doing what we had to do because it's rooftops, the rest would have been more than five houses burned. For sure. people in houses that no. can't really get to well, we assist the firemen by you know, carrying the horses and try to hold the fire from a different angle and contain everything, you know, so as neighborhoods, because we all live around here the same way, you know. A newly elected member of parliament for the city of Bridgetown, Corey Lane, and Democratic Labour Party candidate in the recent general election, Kimar Stewart, were both on the scene. Lane, who expressed dismay that yet another fire tragedy had occurred in the city, said the immediate focus was assisting those displaced. I've reached out to the agencies 
the NHC, they are sending to officials, the welfare department. My main concern is that when the sun goes down, that these families have a, a, a roof over their heads and they have the personal effects to ensure that they have a, a comfortable night. And that is what I'm working on right now. That is my main aim. Everything else is secondary. I mean, of course, on top of all of that, everybody is safe. There have been no injury, except for myself and some of my team were assisting taking some of the things out of the house. Somebody have a nail injury, those things are super minor. Um, but we, we really prevented what could have been a lot more. And the community, uh, so big shout out to the Barbados Fire Service and the community, of, of particularly the young boys that are here on top of the roof, breaking down the doors, helping the fire service on top of the roofs, picking up where the fires are and really doing a fantastic job. Stuart described the tragedy as heartbreaking. The damage is irre irreplaceable and I just want to thank the, the fellows in the community who ran to the aid and trying to help, trying to clear the hoses. Uh, you can see some of the fellows still uh, having the hoses, trying to out the fire as well. So we, we all played our part in trying to assist um, with the damage, but it's only so much we can do. We were unable to really save many of the properties, but our efforts were still important. And I just want to thank the, the fire service and the police for responding. And I'm sending out an SOS for persons to aid and assist the families who would have been affected by the fire today. In today's COVID-19 update, a 17-year-old girl died from COVID-19 on Sunday, bringing the death toll to 276. She was fully vaccinated and succumbed to the viral illness at the Harrison's Point Isolation Facility. Meanwhile, there were 497 new COVID-19 cases, 208 males and 289 females, from the 2017 tests carried out by the Best Santos Public Health Laboratory. The number of people in isolation facilities was 125, while 7,321 were in home isolation. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, I am Onika. I am a mother, I'm a daughter, and I'm a wine educator. When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental, so at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, Make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To regional news, Wednesday is budget day in Guyana. And as we hear in this report for Newsroom Guyana, sources say it's expected to be the country's largest fiscal package. Funding for infrastructure that will both improve the country's current situation and plan for the future has been placed high on the agenda in the 2022 national budget, Vice President Dr. Barjak Dio has announced. Just hours after it was disclosed on Friday that the budget will be presented to the country on January 26, Jack Dio in a televised interview said the government was keen to balance the spending for now and future welfare. The Vice President promised new highways and roads, investment in energy and information and communication technology with efforts to make businesses more competitive and generate more jobs for citizens. So you will see the framework that we establish in our manifesto and we have spoken about that framework of ensuring infrastructure for future growth that that will be one of the dominant areas in the budget. So new highways, roads, investing on power grid, on ICT, the same things that make our business more competitive so we can generate more jobs and more diverse jobs in agriculture, in ICT, in other areas, not just oil and gas. That's, that's one area that will be a dominant area in the budget. Many people believe you can spend every cent now and consume it. If you do that, you can't plan for future years, increase prosperity in the future years. 
So we're balancing the spending on ourselves now versus future welfare. On the international scene, U.S. President Joe Biden is being a blame for empty shelves in supermarkets. The winter weather and the surge in Omicron cases is also causing more shortages of basic items. We get the details from Al Jazeera Television. Across the U.S., supermarkets are again experiencing supply shortages of such basic goods as milk, eggs, and other household items. A wave of Omicron cases, global supply chain issues, labor shortages, and extreme weather are being blamed for the lack of goods. Another contributing factor, the trucking industry. Some 70% of goods delivered in the U.S. are by road. The main lobbying group for the trucking company says it needs an extra 80,000 new drivers to get goods where they need to be. And to help meet the demand for drivers, people as young as 18 could soon be allowed to drive trucks interstate after completing a federal apprenticeship program. Four decades ago, in 1980, deregulation turned much of the trucking industry into what we now call the gig economy. Drivers are not paid for the time on the job, but for miles traveled. They basically give the company that you're going to deliver to or pick up from, they give them two hours free to sit there and do whatever they need to do. The driver doesn't get paid. Many truckers are classified as independent contractors, not employees. So companies don't pay for the upkeep of their trucks or invest in truck stops or warehouses. A trucker drives the allotted legal time and then stops wherever they are. You get after 5, 6 o'clock, especially here on the East Coast, 5 o'clock, you might be on the side of the road somewhere trying to find a spot. Is it, there is a shortage. There has been a steep decline in wages for truckers. Between 1977 and 1987, trucker compensation fell by some 35%. The average trucker salary is now around $50,000 a year. But there is another stock statistic. Trucking has an overall job turnover rate of between 74 and 92 percent. That is, between 7 and 9 out of 10 drivers leave their jobs after a year. That's news, but for the very latest, visit our website at www.barbidastoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook. And sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media and Bus Terminals, as well as Screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.